Apples.io. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here uh, talking to researchers at CISA. Uh, you can see my screen. And before I start, uh, let me introduce myself. I have a background in experimental neuroscience with doctoral studies and postdoctoral training. I was a senior editor in plot biology for nine years and motivated by the open access and reproducibility missions of protocols.io, I joined them a bit more than two months ago. Since I am relatively new here, please bear with me if I don't have answers to all of your questions yet. However, Emma Ganley, our director of strategic initiatives is with us behind the screen and I'm sure that she will be able to answer most of your questions if I can do it myself. Also, you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask questions. You can type them in the chat and Emma will take care of them as we go. <clears throat> I also apologize, uh, my, voice, my voice is a little bit hoarse, I'm a little bit sick. But, um, so you can see the agenda on the screen. I will speak for about 35 minutes and we will leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. We're also recording this presentation and we'll send it along with the slides to all registered participants. And then you can feel free to distribute both documents um, among your colleagues. In this webinar, I will touch on three broad points going from general to specific about the importance of sharing detailed experimental protocols. I will speak about a framework to support science advancement. I will present protocols.io's mission. And then I will briefly introduce the platform and the way that it can improve uh, while you do research or teach not only by making your research fair and by maximizing the ways in which you get credit, but also by simplifying both the way you collaborate with colleagues and the way that you run and archive your protocols. So let's start by explaining why we think that we should all be sharing detailed experimental protocols. And there are two main reasons. One is to adhere to the fair principles of research, which were originally proposed back in 2016 for data. However, because data can only be properly interpreted as we, <clears throat> sorry, if we understand how they were acquired, then these principles can be extended to the way data was collected, that is to the experimental protocols. The second reason is that research is actually modular. However, traditionally, we only recognize and grant credit to one of these modules of research, which is data, and mostly their interpretation. But in reality, when researchers are working, they spend a lot of time in a different module of research. They are developing, optimizing, troubleshooting and tweaking the experimental methods they need to generate high quality and reliable data. Nonetheless, these researchers barely obtain credit for the effort put into method development and optimization, which are usually relegated to one or two sentences in the methods sections or supplements of papers. So let's talk about what it means to be FAIR. FAIR is the acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Started with findable, and this is a point that I think is self-explanatory. For research output to be useful, including data and methods, they need to be findable. Sorry. So we have collected a series of tweets 
that comments on the difficulties and frustrations of trying to find the right information to understand and reproduce published experiments. As you can read on the screen, Daniel goes from reference to reference, trying to understand how the devices used in a 2017 paper were fabricated. And when he finally reaches the original 2009 publication, <clears throat> sorry, it, simple, it simply says, devices were fabricated with conventional methods. This is just an example that highlights a widespread problem. That is, very often, the information reported or included in the materials and methods section of published articles is insufficient to allow readers to understand what was done and to reproduce the experiments. The methods are not findable. As part of the background on why we created protocols.io, we like to talk about the Cancer Biology Reproducibility Project, which was a $1.5 million initiative coordinated by the Center for Open Science and by Science Exchange with the goal of trying to independently replicate almost 200 experiments from about 50 high profile papers on cancer biology. What the reproducibility project researchers discovered very soon after the project began is that it is very difficult to replicate previously published work. There are several reasons why this is the case, but one of them is that the original researchers didn't document in their articles with enough detail what they did and how they did it. What you see on the screen is a Center for Open Science website that summarizes some of the results of the Cancer Biology Reproducibility Project. And as you can see, of the 900, sorry, 193 experiments they tried to replicate from 53 articles, 0%, 0 of the protocols were completely described which made it impossible to reproduce them without contacting the original authors. Again, detailed experimental methods are not findable. Furthermore, when researchers from the reproducibility project contacted the original authors, they also discovered that these did not always could tell how exactly their own experiments had been done. Therefore, the problem of lack of reproducibility goes beyond the lack of adequate reporting in published articles, but also highlights deficiencies in the way researchers keep record of their own experimental protocols for housekeeping. This is caused, among other reasons, because people move from labs. Students graduate and leave, postdoctoral researchers become faculty elsewhere, and so on. Now, what about accessible? So this is another tweet that exemplifies recurrent issues related to data and method accessibility. After navigating a chain of reference in search for the detailed protocol that would allow him to properly interpret data and repeat the experiment, Morgan cannot access the method, oh, sorry about that, because they are behind a paywall. Therefore, for research to be useful, it needs to be not only findable, but also accessible. To maximize accessibility, it makes sense that one deposits one's data and detailed experimental methods in an open access repository. Moving on to interoperable, what does it mean? Interoperable means that data and experimental methods also need to be presented in a way that they can be easily integrated with other data or methods and interoperated with other workflows or pipelines. We also need to understand how they integrate with other research modules from the laboratory. Therefore, 
we should be able to answer the following questions with providing data and methods. Can we trace the data to the experimental methods? How are they connected to a publication? How do they integrate within the production of the lab? And finally, with respect to being reusable, enough detail needs to be provided and in such a format that the reader can reuse the information. For example, if you provide your data as an Excel spreadsheet or as a MATLAB file, that is way more usable than if you provide them as a list of number, numbers in PDF format or as JPEG. Same with methods. A detailed list of precise steps in a recipe-like format is more reusable than a narrative that contains no detailed information. And this brings us back to the original slides that I showed you before. Most of the published papers offer not enough information that would allow readers to reuse the methods. In fact, when referring to the Cancer Biology Reproducibility Project, which received considerable press attention, the American magazine The Atlantic reported that the hardest part by far was figuring out exactly what the original laboratories did. We know that scientific papers should come with methods section that should provide recipes for doing the same experiments. But we also know that most of the time those recipes are incomplete, missing out important steps, details, or ingredients, and that in some cases, the recipes aren't described at all. Thus, despite the generous funding and the clear cut objectives, just repeating 53 experiments, the replication hurdles forced the reproducibility scientists to scale down the project and only attempt to repeat 18 of the 53 experiments. Therefore, lack of fair reporting hinders reproducibility and therefore science advancement and potentially translation into the clinic. <laughs> and I think that in a way, this lack of attention to fair reporting is a result of focusing on research outputs in a very single-mindedly way. As I mentioned before, the traditionally recognized output has been the final peer-reviewed paper. Now we have shifted it slightly and we are more accepting of preprints and funders and universities accept preprints and encourage early sharing of research this way. And we have also started to see a lot of more sharing of data and code, but reporting of detailed methods has been lagging behind. And this really misrepresents how research is done because getting the methods right to obtain high quality and reliable data requires huge effort from part of the researchers and sometimes weeks or even months, if not years of work. Also, as mentioned before, data can only be interpreted if we understand how they were collected. By if we don't provide enough detail into how data were obtained, we cannot understand them or reproduce them. I think that to increase experimental reproducibility, scientific integrity and accountability, to ease interpretability of data and to grant credit to researchers because or for their careful experimental work, researchers should be reporting their detailed methods. And this is where protocols.io kicks in because its mission is simple. It is about making it easy for researchers to share the details of their experimental methods before, during, and after publication. Protocols.io is a cloud-based platform to develop, organize, and archive detailed experimental protocols and to share them privately with collaborators or publicly with the world via publication. Now, 
Protocols.io is not only a platform to share detailed protocols, but as I show you also during this presentation, it offers many advantages that directly or indirectly link to these main objectives. So before I explain how protocols.io enables fair communication of research output and facilitates gaining credit, I would like to show to you some neat features of the platform for protocol development. Hopefully you can see the movie on the screen. So the protocols created in protocols.io go far beyond a PDF. They are organized in a step-by-step -step fashion. Different sections are coded with different colors. The protocols are dynamic and interactive. As you can see, readers or collaborators can ask questions or post comments into the platform. It also has a runnable version where you can run your protocol from your cell phone, tablet, or computer and follow the progress in the experiment by completing every step of the experiment. And as you go along, you can add comments or tweaks to the protocol and record all this information into the platform. I will elaborate on some of these features later on. This slide is just a teaser, so you get an idea of what a detailed protocol looks like in our platform. Let me move to the next slide. <clears throat> now, I will explain how protocols.io both enables fair method reporting and facilitates earning credit for method development. Let's start with findable and accessible. Protocols.io is an open access repository for detailed experimental protocols. Anyone can come along and for free, deposit and publish their protocols. And anyone in the world can come and equally for free, search for those protocols and read them and use them. All published protocols received a unique digital object identifier or DOI and are published under a CCBY license, meaning that anyone can read them, use them and reuse them. Currently, we have over 100,000 registered users, but you don't need an account to access and read the public protocols, but you need one to create protocols and to publish them. The registered users have published more than 10,000 public protocols and have created more than 40,000 private protocols. To create private protocols, which are only visible to the author and selected collaborators, authors require a premium account, either personal or institutional, and that incurs in a cost. I will talk a little bit more about the free open access platform and the private side of protocols.io later on. Protocols enables findability and accessibility because it is free to sign up, it is free to use and publish, and is fully open access. All its published content is also searchable, sorry, that you can see on the right side of the screen. And we're currently working for better indexing across the rest of research publishing and communication infrastructure. Moving on to interoperable. Protocols.io is integrated with other applications that focus on credit for scientists. So when you sign up, you can sign up with ORCID and any protocol you publish will automatically appear as works on your ORCID profile. Therefore, there is also some recognition building on methods as a valuable research output. You can remove these protocols from your ORCID account, however, if you don't wish them, if you don't, if you want, if you don't want to have them there. Although uh, this might be of less interest to researchers, 
We have also a fully open application programming interface or API for protocols.io. And the open API allows protocols.io to integrate efficiently with other applications, such as the one I mentioned before with Orkey. Uh, finally, a lot of journals, publishers, and funders endorse and recommend protocols.io. And in some instances, these are partnering much more closely with protocols.io to join the research output dots and to help support a more modular approach in scientific communication and assessment. More and more institutions are signing up for an enterprise license that allows their faculty to collaborate in private spaces before publishing their protocols on the free open access repository. Over 500 journals recommend authors place their methods in protocols.io. And we recently launched a new partnership with PLOS ONE by which a novel protocol deposited in protocols.io can be submitted for peer review to PLOS ONE for potential publication as a lab protocol article. This peer reviewed paper will be bidirectionally linked to the protocol in protocols.io. With respect to being reusable, the DOI means that protocols are citable. If you search Google Scholar, you will find protocols within papers and citations and some researchers add them to the reference list as I show you right now on the screen. This also means that even if you publish your paper in a journal that is behind a paywall, the readers will have access to the protocols, to the protocol in protocols.io by following the link of the protocol in the reference list of the paper. Another way to reuse the protocol is on the platform if you have an account which, as I mentioned before, is free to make. So if you want to replicate and run through a protocol, you can do so dynamically, directly, by linking, sorry, by clicking the run function and then ticking, as I showed you before, each step of the method as you work your way through. A user can add notes along the way or even tweak a step and record any change that they make as they do so. And that's what I showed you in the movie. And the platform even comes with a timer integrated so you can add different timers to different steps and the reader can use them as well. It is also really easy for someone to make a copy or fork of a protocol on protocols.io and then modify it for their own purposes. And the great thing about how protocols.io works is that these forks can be seen. So you can track the evolution of a protocol this way. I am showing you, I am showing you on the screen an example of a much access method for which the second version has had multiple copies forked and each of those has several versions. This reuse of the original protocol can be easily visualized on the platform. In addition, because readers can ask questions or make comments on specific steps of the protocol in the platform, and all questions and answers are tracked, this simplifies the communication between the authors and the readers. In this example, the authors originally published an abbreviated version of the protocol in Nature Communications as part of a paper. But the author was getting so many questions about the protocol that he decided to upload a detailed version to protocols.io. The questions kept coming, but the record of question and answer in protocols.io became eventually a sort of Q&A resource to which readers could refer instead, instead of emailing the author. And you can see now how the functionality of commenting works. So reader can 
press the bubble with the plus sign. They can type their question or comment, post it, and the author of the protocol will be notified via email. Then they can come and respond <clears throat> to the question or coming directly on the platform. And the author of the comment would also be notified. And this slide shows how the platform allows you to dynamically compare an old version of a protocol to a new one. In this example, the new version will be to the left and the old version to the right and the changes are marked in red. And the platform does this automatically. Now, the modularity of research output and the fact that a protocol can get a DOI independently of the research article also means that the work can be simplified, sorry, <coughs> can be simplified while writing a paper because the materials and methods section of an article can be simply summarized as a DOI that the protocol received from protocols.io. If the reader clicks on the link of the protocol, it will take the reader to the protocol in protocols.io. And as I mentioned previously, the protocols in our platform are versionable. So a really nice feature of using protocols.io as your method section is that the protocol can be updated. So the reader will have access to the original published version of the protocol, which is what you see on the screen right now, but they will also be offered the newest version that the authors have optimized and updated since publication. Being able to separate the methods from the paper also increases discoverability and reuse of the method itself. This slide shows a nice example. You can see a tweet from a researcher in Chile who was looking for a protocol for RNA extraction from primary cortical neuron cultures. Someone answered this tweet and recommended a protocol that is up in protocols.io. But this protocol was actually part of a paper that was published in the journal Giga Science. But the paper was about a fish parasite, the three-spine stickleback parasite. So the chances of researchers working on primary cortical neuron finding a paper on the fish parasite as a mean of finding a method that will work for them seems really slim. But because the protocol was published independently, separating it from the biological question addressed in the paper, it made the method more discoverable, discoverable and increased the chances of people reusing it. By being able to put methods in protocols.io alongside various repository, where you might have the data, you start seeing researchers now really managing to practice open science with all these interoperable modules. What I show you on the screen are a few examples that we have pulled out from Twitter. The first one to the left has a paper in BioArchive, the protocol in protocols.io, and the package presumably of code, of code in GitHub. The same with RONA. So the code and protocols are in GitHub and protocols.io respectively, and the paper is fully accessible in epilepsy. Now, the Allen Institute, uh, they are freely sharing reproducible methods as an essential component of open science and open access. And they are really pushing their protocols to protocols.io. And Finally, to the right, the data and code in uh, Open Science Framework and the protocols in protocols.io. This might seem like a lot of effort to do this, but actually, if you start to undertake your research with this framework in mind and developing and storing the different modules of your research into the different specialized repositories, actually, you are making life easier for yourself down the line when the time comes to publish. Your methods, code, 
data and narrative will be all properly organized and archived for anybody to use in the future, including yourself, when you want to start building on your own previous findings. And then finally moving on to the credit part of the talk. As I mentioned before, because research is modular and because researchers spend a lot of time and effort developing and optimizing methods, publication of detailed protocol, protocols independently but interoperably of a research paper allows researchers to obtain granular credit for their work. A published protocol with an assigned DOI is a citable object that can be referenced to in a paper. And as I mentioned before, the reference will be linked to the protocol in protocols.io so the reader will have access to the interactive step-by-step -step protocol, even if the paper is published behind a paywall. And the platform keeps record of all traffic and use of this protocol, including the number of views, bookmarks, export, copies, comments, and citations. And that is what you can see in the screen right now. As I previously mentioned, published detailed protocols can be easily reused because readers can copy them to use them directly or to modify them for their particular needs and create new versions. However, the platform will link the new versions to the original one. So if a reader follows the link, it will bring them to the original protocol, preserving credit for the original author. In this way too, readers can appreciate the development and optimization of the protocol. So I have explained why I think researchers should be sharing and publishing their detailed protocols and how protocols.io fits in as an open access platform. I will now like to talk more about some of the features of protocols.io that would allow easy development, optimization, and sharing of protocols. So I will start by saying that protocols.io comes in two flavors. It has a free open access repository, which provides unlimited protocols to the user, as long as they are made public. Users can public, publish all these protocols, getting a unique DOI for each of them. The premium accounts offer everything that the free plan offers, plus an unlimited number of private protocols and workspaces, premium training, and for the institutional accounts, a free import protocol service, which means that our editors will upload to the platform any existing protocol in any format. It can be a PDF or a Word document. So we will do that work for you. You can find more details about our plans at protocols.io slash plans slash academia. And I will explain briefly what workspaces are. So protocols.io, the platform has the three main sections. It has the workspaces, the file manager and the editor. The workspace is where everything happens. It is from this space that you create protocols, organize your work, and collaborate with others. The workspace has a folder that is organized by the file manager. And in the file manager, you can use the editor to create and edit protocols. So if you go to our website, this is the landing page. You can create an account if you have not done so already and log in. Once you log in, the system will ask you to create a workspace, which you can make public or private. At this stage, the system will ask you if you wish to invite anybody to join the workspace so you can, you can collaborate, but you don't have to do so at this stage. 
I am inviting myself in the example that I am showing on the screen. So once you create the workspace, you can access its folder and that will take you to the file manager, which is currently empty because the workspace is new, but you can start creating new protocols with the new button and select from many different templates that you can further uh, customize and develop using the editor, which is what you see on the screen right now. So this is the editor. So the editor is a tool to create and edit detailed protocols. It comes with advanced annotation to increase the precision and detail. And from the workspace, collaborators can edit or comment on the protocol and all edits are recorded and can be rolled back. The editor also allows researchers to create independent improved versions. And while developing, they can fork the protocol to test different variables. Just as a reminder, the protocols created with the editor are highly dynamic and interactive. They have a step-by-step -step format that you can see right now. Different sections are coded in different colors. You can insert images or figures and also videos that I showed you at the end. So these are all part of the protocol. The protocol can be imported and printed as a PDF. So you can have a hard copy next to you in your bench while you do the experiments, but you can also run the experiment directly from the computer, tablet, or cell phone. They are interactive because collaborators and other readers can ask questions or post comments and the authors will be notified. The file manager is where the detailed protocols are stored and organized. In addition to the protocols, it supports any file type, including PDFs, Word documents, and Excel spreadsheets. So you can upload relevant, for example, equipment manuals, reagent lists, previously created protocols in different formats, and it can be connected to Dropbox and Google Drive. So you can move your documents. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the workspace is the space for collaborations in protocols.io. It allows researchers to bring structures to your research by providing a secure platform where to develop and share reproducible methods. You can access, sorry, you can make the workspace public or private. You can invite collaborators within and outside CISA to join your workspace. And you can create multiple workspaces with different members and different protocols depending on your research and teaching needs. You can also search and join any public workspace that has been previously created by colleagues elsewhere in the world. As I mentioned previously, the platform is really intuitive and easy to navigate. And I have given you some teasers, but there's so much functionality that could, we could have spent another hour talking about it. Instead of doing that, and for those who want to learn more, I will refer you to the multiple resources we have generated for training purposes. So I'm gonna move out of the presentation and go to uh, the internet. So uh, you can see, you can still see my screen. Uh, if you go to our website and go to protocols.io slash webinar, you will see the webinar that we have pre-scheduled for all the public. And these are free to access. We also have drop-in clinics, which are user-based or, or user-driven sessions to answer questions and answers, to answer, sorry, questions about the protocol. You don't need to register for this clinic. You just show up uh, whenever they happen. We also have a collection of pre-recorded tutorials about the different functions and functionalities of protocols.io. And if you scroll all the way down, you will have 
the option to request a one-to-one -one demo. So you will have to the opportunity to talk to one of us for half an hour to discuss any questions. And now going back to the presentation. Uh, Oh no, this is not what I wanted you to see. Okay. So let me see. And now, so this is the end of the presentation and we have a few minutes to answer any questions that you might have. So, Gabrielle, there have been a few questions um, from Michelle, who <laughs> has also apologized in the chat for asking so many questions, but actually it's amazing that there have been so many brilliant questions. I've answered um, a few of them already in the Q&A, but it might be worth just quickly running through those for the purpose of the recording so that they're tracked. Um, and there are a couple there, though, that also still need to be answered live. So I don't know if you can okay, see. Okay, let me see. You still see my screen, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I can ask the Diana asked if whether, if uh, author of a protocol is just one person or can it be a group of people? So it might be nice to just show an example where there's a lot of authors. Yes. So um, you can add collaborators to your protocol at the time of publication. Um, let me show you an example. So you can see my screen. Uh, these are protocols that I put together in Spanish for, these are protocols about how to use the platform that I put together for a uh, Spanish university. I didn't create the protocol originally. It was created in English by people uh, from protocols.io. So you can see that in the protocol, there are several authors who created the English version and myself who created the Spanish version. So yes, uh, more than one author can be added to the protocol itself. And as I mentioned, you know, from the, in a workspace, you can have, I'm gonna show you, you know, in a workspace, So the workspace is a space for collaboration. You are seeing all my workspaces. Each workspace have different members. So I can collaborate with different people in different projects. If you go to a specific workspace and you open the profile, you will see all the members of that workspace and they will all have access to the private protocol while it is being developed before publication, and they all can make comments or edit the protocol. So it's a collaborative enterprise. I hope that I answered your question. Um, let me see another question from Michelle Giugliano. Are you, in, are you looking at the chat or the Q&A? I'm looking at the chat. Okay. Maybe can we come back to Michelle's in the chat and look at the ones in the Q and A quickly first? Because okay, think okay. Easy. So let's go to the Q and A. Uh, so Diana was asking if it's possible to do an amendment or correction to already published papers with a detailed protocol. Yes, that's a very very good question. So actually, by using protocols.io, if you realize that you had a mistake in your original publication, rather than issuing a correction to the paper itself, what you can do is you can update your protocol in protocols.io. Once a protocol is published in protocols.io, it receives a DOI and you cannot further, you cannot longer modify it, but you can create a new version that will be linked to the original protocol. So you create a correction in protocols.io and when a reader is reading the paper that you published that has a mistake and follows the protocol to protocols.io, it will be automatically taken to both the original version that has a mistake 
as well as a new version that was corrected. So yes, you can correct a paper through protocols.io and you can create not only one, but multiple versions of the same protocol and the reader will have access to all of them as long as you publish those. So Matthew is asking, how would you recommend an investigator, especially a young one who needs to establish a certain number of publications on their trial record, including a protocol on their bibliography? So uh, because you can, you can sign in with ORCID, you can link, sorry. There are many ways of doing that. So one is by using ORCID. So you can create your protocols.io account with ORCID and you can link those two. So every time you publish a protocol, ORCID automatically will pull it into your ORCID profile and it will appear in the section that is called works in ORCID and reaching your CV this way. And another way will be to consider submitting your uh, protocol independently of uh, the biological question uh, that you want to address, just submit the protocol as an independent article, as a lab protocol to plus one, it will be peer reviewed and eventually published. So that will be my recommendation to link uh, your account in protocols.io with ORCID and also consider sending your protocols to peer review at protocol at PLOS One. So we have a partnership with PLOS One, but this is not the only journal that publishes protocols. So you can send it to PLOS One, but any other journal that also publishes protocols. I hope that, an that answered your question, uh, Matthew. Um, yes. So, Gabriel, some of uh, Michelle's questions I kind of answered with text already. So they're on the answered tab and they relate to what he's put into the chat as well. So it might be worth just running through those. So, yeah, a question by Michelle is also is like, why GitHub and Sonata alone would not be a good platform for sharing protocols? So, uh, we develop uh, protocols.io with dynamic features and functionalities that go beyond what GitHub offers. Actually, I'm not a developer myself. Our developers use GitHub and they relied on GitHub. But uh, we serve a broader audience. We are not just a computational our audience is not exclusively computational for code. You can develop protocols for many different purposes. In this way, uh, people at facilities use our protocols to interact with users, to explain them how to book an equipment, how to prepare the sample to be analyzed in that equipment. Uh, would it be microscopy? or uh, sequencing. And the scientists can also ask questions about uh, those protocols via the platform. And I think that the main reason is that protocols.io was developed with the intention of having detailed protocols. So the step-by-step -step, uh, organization, the color coding, the embedding of figures and videos, and the dynamic and interacting nature of the protocol, not only with your collaborators, but also with the wider, wider audience once you publish the protocol. I think it makes it a tool that doesn't compete, but complement GitHub and Sonoto. Um, So another question is how time proof is a multimedia rich text proprietary format of the protocol? Doesn't open science promote simple file format so, such as Markdown and 
ASCII. So as Emma responded, the protocol can be exported in various formats, including HTML, and we archive and backup all content in multiple places. All content is backed up in GitHub, for example, and we're working on a more comprehensive content archive with uh, the Chan Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg Initiative that will include the dynamic comments and media included in the protocol as well. Uh, Michelle also asked, do you already partner with EOSC and avoid potentially duplicating efforts? And EOSC is a European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and we don't yet have a partnership with EOSC, but we will look into this. Export is already be possible to any specified location uh, if this were a requirement. Um, Michelle also asked whether uh, we enable actively host operate Jupyter notebooks, and we don't have this functionality, but we do have integrations with some other ELNs uh, like Airspace and SignNote. We are, but we are always exploring possible additional partnerships and integrations. And you are not the first person, the first person to ask. So we will raise this again with the team. Uh, Diana asked about authorship, which we have already discussed, and about corrections as well, which we discussed. And Matthew asked about the young investigator, which we also discussed. So I think that those are all the questions. So if um, there are no more questions, we can actually, Emma, will you stop the recording? Of course.